Okay, hunters. Can we think of hunters as being the ultimate stewards? A lot of people are laughing right now, but if you ask the average American, what do you think of uh, the average hunter? Draw me a picture. They might come up with something like this. You know? And I, I don't know who this guy is. This is, sadly, if you Google hunter, this is what pops up. <laughs> You know, actually the first, if you Google deer hunting, I've been doing a lot of this lately because I've been, you know, interested in how uh, these Google hits reflect sort of public, you know, knowledge about what hunting is. If you Google deer hunting, like the first eight images are stills grabbed from the deer hunter video game. Where the guy's like driving around the ATV and shooting deer. Doesn't bode well. But are hunters the ultimate stewards? Maybe not, but... Maybe so, right? Certainly not every conservation giant that we've had in our country has been a hunter. But some of the key folks have had a uh, big impact uh, as a result of their experiences as hunters. So it really depends. And I would encourage you not to prejudge what hunters are, what, what hunters are like. Because the fact of the matter is, for example, in 2006, um, we had about 650,000 hunters just in the state of Wisconsin. That's about 11% of the population. Among these 650,000 people, there were probably rapists, probably uh, chronic law violators of all sorts, child molesters, but there are also a lot of people who really care about the resource. You know, it's like saying, what are people who drive Honda's like. There's some that are real jerks and there's some that are probably really nice people, right? It's a huge percentage of the population, it's a huge number of people, and you cannot paint us all with a broad paintbrush. That being said, uh, hunters oftentimes don't do much to re represent ourselves well. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, are hunters public relations specialists? I would have to say a resounding no. Let's think about the way hunters represent themselves to the non-hunting public for a moment. When you see bumper stickers on cars and trucks, mostly trucks, driving around, these are some of the common ones I see. You know? And the, okay. This is probably not very respectful to animal rights people. This is certainly not respectful to them. And I would say these two are not very good representations of why most people are out there hunting. I looked through so many of these bumper sticker things online, and I could not find one that said, venisonaholic. <laughs> and I could not find one that said, size doesn't matter, with a doe head on it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, a lot of us are out there hunting because we want to put some venison in our freezer. And you know, at the risk of being potentially teased by some of my fellow hunting comrades in here, I have shot some deer that were not monstrous deer, and they tasted great, and I used them, and I was thrilled to take them home and put them in my freezer. And this is not how all of us are. But the sad thing is, this is the paintbrush we are often painted with, because the people who are most vocal people who are putting the message out there, in my opinion, are putting out the wrong message. This is not a message of respect for the resource. This is a message of some, you know, testosterone-driven foolishness in a lot of cases. And the fact is, I went to high school in a very rural place in northern Michigan. Um, most of my friends had these sort of stickers on their truck and we just thought it was funny. We didn't think about how we were representing ourselves to the non-hunting public. And I don't think hunters are necessarily even thinking about the non-hunting public. They're trying to, you know, establish themselves within the fraternity of hunters as being part of the game. But it does a pretty bad job of representing us. More examples. These deer hunting t-shirts that you see. I mean, you've got upper left, deer camp. It's all fun and games until the beer runs out. What happens at deer camp stays at deer camp with the silhouette of a a uh, busty lady in the window there. Beer, the official beverage of Deer Camp. Perfect 10 with some 
sexy mom and a big butt. So, you know, if you see four guys walking around with these four t-shirts, you're going to figure that deer hunters are uh, sexually frustrated alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> Basically is what it boils down to. And I got to say I'm neither, right? <laughs> More examples of poor representation. And I want this to be honest. This discussion today is honest. That's why I'm pointing this stuff out. Because I know those of you who don't hunt see this stuff and think these things. And I think these things too, and I'm a hunter. So I'm getting it out there. Within the hunting community, there's a huge amount of competitiveness. Who got the biggest buck? Who got the biggest turkey? Who got the most ducks? These conversations happen, you know, among groups of hunters ad nauseum. There's this emphasis on trophy deer, trophy turkeys, getting the biggest, like I said. Those two kind of go together. One of the ugliest ones, I think, is this, this selfishness. Um, among the hunting community, if you've got a good spot, the general tendency is to hoard that spot for yourself, not try to get other people out there, not try to share that opportunity with other folks. And, you know, as I've developed as a hunter, I've felt that way. I felt like, man, I've got a really good spot. I'm not telling anybody about it. In recent years, I've started to realize it's more fun to get out there with other people and share it a little bit. Along those lines, an unwillingness to welcome new and interested people. There are a few groups that are probably less approachable than a group of, you know, five-day beard guys standing around a truck talking about their hunt. If you're somebody who's <coughs> new to trying to hunt, and you're going to, you want to walk up and ask them a question or maybe find out you know, where a good spot to go is, that's a pretty unapproachable group. And, and you know, it's, it's our fault that we don't do more to be welcoming. And then also focus on what is, what is being taken in terms of animals. You know, did I get a bag from it? Did I get a big buck? Versus what is given back in terms of uh, trying to foster a healthy ecosystem, trying to get time involved, uh, mentoring new hunters, or um, you know, helping the habitat out maybe with prescribed burning, those sorts of things. That's not all hunters, right? In fact, I would, I would go so far as to say that's not the majority of hunters. I would say the majority of hunters are people who care very passionately about these resources. Because I know a lot of hunters. And people put in time all year long thinking about these resources. They put in time putting up nesting boxes. They put in time uh, manipulating the private property that they own. They take tillable acres and set them aside as forest, like my landlord does, so that he's got wildlife on his property because he likes to see, he likes to see the geese in the pond, he likes to see the deer, he likes to see the turkeys. People care who hunt. Um, we also put in a lot of money. For example, I've been here in Wisconsin now for five years. Um, Every year I've bought a conservation patron's license. Every year I've bought a federal duck stand. So in my five years here, I've paid $900 for the privilege to hunt and fish every year. This conservation patron's license covers basically everything you want to do outdoors, hunting, fishing, your camping license. And to me, $900 is a steal. That's probably like 25 cents an hour for the recreational benefit I've gotten from that. Um, and then also my time and energy. You know, I put a lot of time in teaching hunter safety classes and getting out and trying to get new people in the woods and working with the Rough Grouse Society and, you know, just trying to stay uh, active with these issues. 